Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, everybody. David, hello. So lovely to talk to you. Yeah, you guys too. When do you ha- absolutely have to be done? I want to make sure we um, are sensitive to your schedule, but we also got a late start. I think I'm fine. There's nothing like really pressing for this afternoon, so. Okay, okay, If awesome. we run over 50 minutes, it won't be a problem. Probably want to slip in some lines from a Michelle Obama speech. Yes, <laughs> actually, that would, be, <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> Good. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. And I'm Jamie. And this is Clever. Hey, before we get started, we want to ask you a favor. If you enjoy listening to this podcast, would you please give us a review or a rating on iTunes? It really helps us out. Totally. We'd really appreciate that. So today we're talking to lighting, furniture, and toy designer David Weeks. David Weeks has made a name for himself with his stunning light fixtures. And while he's a highly successful New York-based designer with a beautiful showroom in Tribeca, personality-wise... He is exactly the opposite of the stereotypical, high-strung, success-conscious drama magnet. He's mild-mannered, quietly observant, and he's got a quick but dry wit that catches you off guard in the most endearing way. We know you'll love our talk with him as much as we did. One thing that made a huge impression on us is how he talked about his career being largely a result of him having the confidence to go wherever he feels pulled to take leaps into uncharted territory because of an inner knowing that somehow it would all work out. Now, we're not talking about overt confidence and bluster. You know, it's not ego-based. David doesn't have an ounce of arrogance in him. And that may be because he doesn't need to puff himself up, precisely because of this inner knowing. So that got us thinking about this quality. And if it's something that we're all born with that sometimes gets subverted by all the other stuff we go through, or if it's something that your parents instill in you through nurture, or if it's something we can teach ourselves later in life if we don't already have this skill kind of highly honed. What's your take on it, Jamie? Yeah, gosh, if, if it can be taught, I want to sign up for that class right now, because this <laughs> yeah, is totally not like like anything. I'm much more of the high strung, like warrior, freaking out, stressed out person. Would you characterize yourself as extremely cautious? No, I think I'm a risk taker, but I like to have my ducks lined up. I like to anticipate all of the things that could go wrong and then already plan solutions for all those things. But and David's then have like contingency A, contingency B, yeah, contingency C. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and David's kind of the opposite. Like he he seems to go with the flow, with the confidence, knowing that whatever direction it goes, he's going to be able to have a solution for it if there's a problem. Yes. You know, I've been analyzing this because it's not impulsive, right? And it's not extremely practical either. But it seems to be driven more by, I think, a need for expression and fulfillment than by anything external, like validation, success, certainty, security. Mm -hmm. And maybe because he values, you know, that internal fulfillment, that, you know, full expression of, of being a human, maybe that's why he feels so confident that if he goes in that direction... He'll also be able to work with whatever the outcome is and keep massaging it to one of beauty. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I, I think when you say something like that, it reminds me of more of what an artist does. And I think because he has some background doing sculpture, that maybe that's where that comes from. That idea of just like molding something and it, eventually it just the form reveals itself to you. Well, that's what he does with his with his design as well, mm-hmm. with with his reductive process. He yeah. sort of is really confident in working with something until a new form is revealed. Yeah, you got to trust the process. Yeah, he really trusts the process. And in fact, we should get him to, to create those workshops so we can yeah. both sign up for them. <laughs> totally. All right. So about David, as we mentioned, he does exceptionally elegant lighting design. If you're not familiar with it, you may want to Google it right now. But if you're driving, don't do it while you're driving. Um, and in addition to his lighting, uh, his studio also does furniture, interiors and sculpture for both commercial and residential clients. And he's also responsible for the highly addictive and super fun wooden robot toys called Cube Bots that are distributed by AreaWare along with other playful figures. And if you'd like to see his work in person, he just opened up a beautiful new showroom in Tribeca. And another nice fact about his studio is that all the products are manufactured in Brooklyn. I like that. They've been there a long time. So he's uh, he's deep in New York. All right, let's get deep with David Weeks. <laughs> <laughs> My 
My name is David Weeks, and I am a lighting designer, furniture, toy maker, designer. And I don't know, I guess why is it felt the best after coming out of college. It sort of seemed like the right thing to do. Great. So you were born in Athens, Georgia, correct? That's right. Oh, so what was it like growing up there? It was like a classic small town. It's like the college town. So that's when REM was coming up and all the good music was happening in Athens at the time. So it was actually a really good time to be there. Um, it's a great scale city. I think it was like maybe 30,000 people at the time. So it was like a super safe, really nice, great place to be. I've never been there, but I've heard it compared to like Austin, Texas, and that it's like a hotbed of liberal progressive activity and creativity in the South. Would, would you yeah. agree with that? No, it's great. I mean, that's the funny thing about having come from there because it is a Southern upbringing, but it's actually a very liberal Southern upbringing. So, which is always catches New Yorkers off guard who assume that everyone from the South is you know, clearly inbred. Oh. <laughs> What was your what was your family like? What did your parents do? Did you have siblings? Yeah, I had two sisters. My father worked for the University of Georgia doing research for small town governments. So he'd travel around and talk to like the sheriff in Crawford, Georgia about, you know, how he judges. And like because I guess in the small towns, you know, there's no judge, it's just a sheriff. He's a sort of man of the town. But anyway, that's what he did. He would go around and interview those guys and write books about it. My mom was a public school teacher. She taught third grade. Yeah, it was a pretty straightforward childhood. What kind of things did you like to do as a kid? Did you like to make things or, or did you like to play sports? Were you outside a lot? Yeah, I had like four best friends. We mostly just kind of cruised around and stayed out late and annoyed everyone who was on acid. <laughs> <downtown>. <laughs> uh, were you a making a lot of trouble, troublemaker? I was definitely the guy who everyone was annoyed by because I would come down and I remember this one guy would take acid every week. And whenever he saw me, he'd be like, oh, God, because I was going to like mess with him. So how old are you when you're messing with the acid takers? I guess that was 15 or 16 or something. OK, so old enough to know that he's going to be tripping and and how to fuck with him prop, yeah. <laughs> properly. Right. Properly. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so funny. So did you stay in Athens through high school? Yeah, I moved there when I was two and I left at 17 after high school. You know, we talked a little bit about you making some trouble, but was there any moment in your childhood where you discovered your creativity? I sort of deemed early that that was my skill. Going to public schools, if you weren't good at anything, you often wouldn't get much help to sort of fix that problem. You would just be like, okay, well, you're not good at that. So why don't you move on to something else? Art was there from the beginning. Like I remember, I think in first grade, I sort of drew reflections on the top of water or something in three dimensions or something and the teacher pointed out to my father and he was like he was totally sold from that point on so they were really supportive throughout the years and and that was always going to be what I was going to do. Did you think you were going to be more of a fine artist? Yeah no there was no design was not I, I didn't know what design was Nobody did growing up. I, we got to change that. <laughs> I know. I think you guys are doing a good job getting the word <laughs> Thank out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, it was all about fine arts. It was like, well, you know, like the edgiest work I knew of was Picasso. And the sort of more mainstream was Manet or something, you know. Well, I guess there was a lot of contemporary art being made in Athens, but they were mostly like pottery or folk oriented or printmaking. So Athens is a college town, but you went to study art at RISD. Describe to us the, the pull that you felt. I mean, RISD is a, obviously I'm an alum. It's a great institution, right. but it's also a little bit of a scary step. It's prestigious, but it's also expensive and yeah. art is yeah. not a secure profession. I don't know. I think it's funny because my parents were totally supportive. They didn't sit, make me go to liberal arts school and sort of have a backup classics degree or whatever, which is the sort of seemed to be the, the norm for people I knew who were into the arts. I remember I went to one counselor guy who actually knew about schools and he was like, RISD, Parsons, Pratt, and Tyler. And that's all I did. I was like, okay, I got the name, so I'm going to go check them out. And I went up there on one trip and it sort of ended up being between Parsons and RISD. And then in the end, Parsons was just not where I wanted to be. I mean, I loved New York and the excitement of it. And then <laughs> and RISD, on the other hand, is such a beautiful place. And it sort of felt like a college setting the same way Athens had that sort of college vibe. So it was, it was a natural fit. And 
it was uh, yeah, it was scary, but at the same time, I was clearly ready for that. And it was a great thing because basically my head exploded when I got there. <laughs> nice. I love that creative explosion that happens when you're finally like have all of this stimuli and you can feed your brain with everything it could be hungry mm-hmm. for. Yeah. Now that and also you're like, like all the geeks from your school and you had, there was 10 in the school, the artsy high school. But you know, when you get to Rizzi, you're like, Jesus Christ, everyone's one of those people. I know. Like, There's so many freaks here, but it's all great. You know, it's like, and you sort of, it's like this ultimate liberation of, of the nerd class. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so tell us about the college years were you sort of an experimental art nerd making avant-garde music and you know smoking cigarettes and reading Camus or what were you <laughs> yeah I was not that I was <laughs> okay. I, knew, I knew those people and I was often annoyed by the pretension mm. I think the southern upbringing sort of kept my focus or at least sort of kept a more regular Joe sort of thing going on yeah, I was a sort of normal guy in the middle of all the sort of kookiness. But I was more than happy to be part of the, the problem as well. Or, you know, kind of if it's about drinking or doing whatever or being in bands. Or The great thing about RISD was that, like, we made a video with a friend and we got a car and we all got sledgehammers and we beat this car to a pulp. And the cops rolled by at one point and were like, what are you guys doing? Which is unbelievable that they wouldn't be like, all of you on the ground, you know in the back of the car, but they were just like, it was that great moment where we're like, we're from RISD, we're at this art project. And he was like, okay, all right, have a good day. Yeah. Just a great thing about that city. I mean, I feel like that whole, that College Hill was kind of like off base for the, the regular city police. They didn't know what to do with it. So after RISD, you, you did move to New York City. Yeah, i right? definitely, within a year or two, I knew New York was where I was destined to go. And then what did you do when you hit New York City? I had every intention of being an artist. I mean, I was like living on Canal Street on the fifth floor walk up loft where this guy Juan Gomez, who was like an old printmaker, had a little shop in the back of the loft that he let me use. So I just kind of like did freelance work with decorative painting places and metal shops. And I was just making art for most of the time. It was a great place to be, especially for that time. It was a great year. It was like a year or two. We're talking like 89 or 90? Like 90, 91. I mean, there was like, you know, video stores in Soho and Chicken Slaughterhouse on Broom Street. And it definitely wasn't the 80s. It had its sort of novelty, certainly. And it was definitely an extremely different place back then. Yeah, and no, I'm really happy that I had those 10 years or however long. I don't, you know, it's funny to think back on the 90s because I don't remember it being like the 90s. I'm like, I don't know what the 90s were. Like other than Nirvana, I don't remember anything specific. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was great. My first studio was $400 and I shared it with a friend and it was in Dumbo. Oh, wow. So at some point you ended up taking on an apprenticeship. Is that what happened with a jewelry designer? No, I sort of stumbled into that job. I was oh, okay. working for a decorative painter. So they put me with two other guys in this, in a jeweler's new shop. Ted Mewling opened up his first shop on Green Street and we just painted out the whole place for him. And the other two painters left and I kind of stuck around being like, any, any chairs to refinish? Or I just kept working for him for a while and then eventually settled into a full-time job, which, you know, it was incredibly lucky that that happened. And in the end, that's influenced everything from then on. How? We want to know exactly how it influenced you. I guess, you know, the painting and the art and sculpture, and as far as, and that was an interesting time in art, you know, that was like, you know, Ashley Bickerton and... Like the sort of fabrication, the sort of early rock star artists were kind of getting going then. But there was definitely sort of very calculated, very, you know, personality based art or then this heavy theory stuff that was really maddening to me. Like, oh, you don't get it. Well, <laughs> you can leave now. You know, it's like, well, that's not what I want to be part of. And that kind of goes back to that same upbringing. And it felt very pretentious and like, you know, why are you buying into that? And I'm not interested in being part of that. But anyway, so when I got to Ted's, it was kind of a perfect match in the sense that it was it was art, you know, no doubt it was sculpture. I mean, he makes phenomenal pieces and and it's very explorative. It's not sort of calculated and drawn and, you know, rendered or anything. It's very much like on the belt sander, he would sand down combs from Chinatown and turn them into earrings. Or he just had like a real knack for creating forms and shapes and and then assembling them into these really elegant jewelry. 
And working with materials that were atypical to jewelry, like not just carving wax and setting gems. Yeah, no, I think that was one of the biggest things I learned there was he would go to the flea market up on 26th Street and he would just always come back with like, oh, look at this great ivory piano key that I found. And you'd be like, oh, whatever, it's kind of cool. But then like after he would soak it in water or vinegar and shape it and then sand it and polish it, you're like, holy, like could not believe what he had found inside that total meaningless little piece of plastic. Yeah, he just had a real sense for materiality and the physical world. So anyway, to this day, I still, I feel like he's, he is a mentor and, and a very good friend. I couldn't thank him enough. Was he a mentor in formal respects, but also in entrepreneurial respects? No, it's funny. He was like the ultimate, his ethics were un, untainted. You know, he was totally true to himself and he never, never flinched or wavered in his integrity, which was one of those things which was like totally impressive at the time, but really challenging to like yeah. leave that job and be like, oh, Ted, I, I don't want to sell out, but I, um, <laughs> I need to make some money. Yeah. So it, as far as business goes, it was like that was the next step of learning is to sort of figure out how to take that way of making and an exploratory and you know art sculpture and then turn it into a business which jewelry was definitely the obvious way because just seeing how he did it and stuff but i didn't feel as fair or right that i sort of would jump on that bandwagon so lighting was kind of a kind of a means to an end as far as scale wise and and material wise oh you know that makes a lot of sense because i've heard you say that lighting is the jewelry of the home yeah, and it kind of is. I didn't really think of that initially. It is. It's the twinkle. It's the shiny. It's the, the pretty sort of thing that, well, in jewelry, it reflects light, but in lighting, it casts light. Yeah, but all the mechanisms, the rings, the hooks, the hidden wires, the, yeah, like you're saying, the reflective quality or the cascading elements, you know, there's like, it's all there. And I think, and also just using the techniques from jewelry on steel, which I don't think people were doing like using brazing instead of welding. Anybody in the furniture world at that time was like a macho guy who was like, you know, cutting up these slabs or using this MIG welder to zap stuff together. I'm interested to know how you came about just making your first light. Like, did you see a light one day and think I, that's kind of like something that I would want to make or I'd want to do. And then what was the transition like between working for um, Ted and then transitioning to your own thing? I guess, uh, you know, I was dutifully went into the flea market as well. And I think everyone would approach the flea market with their own point of view. And mine at the time was, you know, the classic gooseneck office light with the gold anodized bullet shade. You know, there's like more of those than you know what to do with. And then thinking of how Ted had sort of reshaped things. I use the same techniques from Ted's in the sense we had a one inch belt sander that you just kind of like eyed up the stuff on and I have a good eye for that. So I like the symmetry was not hard to do. So I just kind of made a, an initial collection of 10 desk lamps. It wasn't a business model as much as it was just a plan to just kind of get the idea out. I had made one lamp initially all by hand with these sort of intersecting ovals and then a, a shade that was brought from the flea market. And then I made 10 more, but I was just, it was sort of exploration. There was like wood veneer shades and there was black oxidized this and carved wood base and a wishbone upright. And it was, it was fun. It was like just kind of me in a room doing this on my own. Yeah. Were you selling these to anybody or did you just have a room full of lamps? Yeah, no, I was pretty much, I was not selling to them initially. There was like one store called She, S-H-I. Troy was um, the other place that I sold stuff to. Initially, it didn't work. What worked was doing custom pieces for architects. I have a quick question to go back to your childhood just real fast. So you're making these lamps and did you get all your your making skills just from working with Ted and from doing sculpture and painting at RISD? Or did you grow up making like were your parents handy and were you doing crafts and making projects while you were growing up? I wasn't I wasn't making stuff, but I think I think I've, I've got a real like sort of natural knack for that stuff where you know, kind of looking at materials and knowing what they'll do. And Okay. So you just felt sort of pulled in that direction and you sort of just went where you were pulled and, and yeah. honed your skills yeah. as you went. Exactly. And I think RISD was fantastic for that too, because I had a really good friend who, in the ID department 
at RISD at the time. And she and I shared a space. And her from the design world was like, oh, I need a diacro bender for that. And I also need like a brake press for this. And then having come from sculpture, I was like, I need a hammer and a vice. And so, you know, you could kind of engineer your own methods of making yeah. things. Yeah. And again, art and RISD specifically, where it's like totally open-ended, the weirder, the better. Sculpture I made all had like, you know, had like speakers built into it or had like, you know, pinball machines involved or it was always kind of like Jerry rigged or sort of MacGyver style sculpture. Okay. So back to where we were, you were making lamps and you got a, a spot by the bathroom at ICFF. And it's funny. People still come up and go like, I remember you at the bathroom. <laughs> everybody like, everybody has That's to go sad. to the bathroom at some point. Yeah, at Javits. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> So was that show like a turning point for you? Well, I I got this one job, that show. This one architect sort of really saw the potential of what the desk lamps illustrated. Mm -hmm. And I got this one huge loft that was being built in Tribeca where there was an elevator shaft that was totally open. and, And they literally were like, whatever you want to do, you know, we have this condition here and this condition here and this condition and they had five different sort of vignettes that I had to had to think of something to put there. And several of the pieces that I did for that guy's apartment are still in the collection today. So it was it was that was the moment because also I remember getting a check for like three thousand dollars or six thousand or whatever it was, and I was thinking like God, I could quit right now. This is like the <laughs> best, you know. I sort of I had succeeded in my mind at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. So again, it's kind of one of those New York stories where you know. You, I would never have gotten that job elsewhere, but the fact that there was, you know, a wealthy guy who trusted his designer, who trusted me. In your mind, are you at all scared of this opportunity? Like, oh, you can't screw up. You got to make it happen. Were you stressed out about it or were you just super excited and happy to have it? Yeah, I'm just super excited. I never once thought like this wasn't going to work. It was always like, I'll figure it out. Like if it doesn't work, I'll, modify it or take it down. But I didn't have the sort of professional fear of like, oh my God, I can't back this up, you know, or (laughs) yeah. And I had a lot of faith in the process, which to this day, I still find like one of those things that it's very different. Like some people like really are dubious of if it's going to work or not. And I've always felt like "Ah, it'll work out. So, which I think is for my mother. Oh, really? Yeah. She's got this real laissez-faire way of approaching life. So yeah, so it's always been really I don't know. I think that's sort of the backbone of part of it. Yeah, I think that's kind of um, an unsung secret superpower Mm -hmm. that some people have. I sort of was the opposite. Like I was raised in like, yeah, go study art. We support you in everything you do, but maybe you should have a backup plan, you know, or And and so I was sort of conditioned to always think about how this could go wrong or. Yeah, that's I think most people are brought up that way. Yeah. And it's sort of it, it conflicted with my natural sense of like, I can figure this out because that's that's what's in my DNA. Like that's what's organic yeah. to my personality. And so I had to work actively as a person to kind of shed that fearful um, what could go wrong kind of mentality. But the fact that you have it's been instilled in you from youth, from a parent, I think. In many ways, uh, probably gave you this sort of quiet undercurrent of confidence that whatever happens, I can manipulate this in a way that will work out. Yeah. I mean, no doubt that's still to this day, opening the store, expanding the business, having 20 employees. It's like, you know, there's so many moments where I could have been like, this is crazy. I got to do something different or change up or should I write that check or should I make this decision? And um, yeah, I think there's sort of a blind faith in the process and, just faith in yourself that whatever pans out, it'll work out one way or another. It's a good attitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right on, and brother. It, and it, well, I sense it in you too, because there's not, some people have this really nervous energy, like they're trying so hard because it has to work, you know, but, right, exactly. but you seem to sort of graciously move through your life, sort of moving forward and making things work. No, I agree. And that's one of the things that's funny to be that person in New York city because there's a lot of people forcing the issues, mm-hmm. kind of pushing ahead. Well, I was thinking that too, and I was going to ask you because it seems like you're just laid back by nature, but has any of the New York, you know, fast paced 
attitude kind of rubbed off on you at all? Yeah, I mean, I think the the opportunity here, along with the people, because the thing, the thing I love, I mean, I really love people. I think, and I, again, that's probably a sudden thing from my mother, where, like, I love the vendors I, I found along the way and the spinner and the powder coater and the laser cutters and whoever else. Like, I would hang out at their shops in the afternoon or, or sort of, you know, get to know them. I had a, a dog at the time, so every time I'd show up, like, all the anodizing guys would be like, oh, hey, did you bring your dog today? Mm. So I think that part of New York and the, yeah, the faith, because I think the city has that same faith in itself in that, that way that it's like, we're going to succeed. You know, I don't need to tell you about it. And I don't need to sort of brag about it because we as a whole will like completely thrive and make money and survive whatever comes mm-hmm. along. So, yeah, I think, I think that was more than New York that I sort of enjoyed being part of. Yeah. I think it, at least, for me, I could learn a lot from the roll with the punches kind of attitude where you just deal with the situation. And then, you know, if something does go wrong, you know, in the back of your mind that you'll figure out a solution and, and, you know, everything will work out in the end. And I think that's a good attitude to have, especially if you're in a high stress place. Yeah. And again, I think like my father, who is much more fearful or wary of doing anything kind of out of the box, I'm pretty sure I got my talent and skills from him. Like he built a shed for himself that was like so beautiful and impeccably built. Mm. But to get him to build that shed took so much effort. Like he'd be like, well, I don't know if I should cut that at a 60 degree angle. It's like, dad, just go for it, man. You'll like, you know, cut a new one if if it doesn't fit. I mean, he did it meticulously down to the detail and it looked fantastic, but he he was never liberated by it or he'd never sort of had the opportunity to be like, oh, now I know what I'm going to make. I'm going to make this instead of that. That's what I got a taste for early on. And I, and that's been feeding the whole fire for over the years. I love that idea of being liberated by the project as opposed to sort of constrained by it. Yeah, I think, well, that's the ultimate thing. It's like, I think the best compliment I ever got was like, you're the most curious person I know. <laughs> and I think that to me was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, that's better than anything else I could ask for. Because that's what sort of fuels life and whatever's happening. And I think so many people who you know, live by the rules or live by expectations instead of by instincts. They don't have faith in themselves to kind of explore and sort of take chances. Yeah, Yeah, you can't be a visionary and live by the rules at the same time. You know, you've got these lights, you're selling them to various retailers around the city. At what point were you like, okay, I'm going out on my own? Pretty much from the beginning. I didn't want to work for someone else. And I had a studio in Dumbo for a while where I was just doing metal fabrication for people like curtain rods and hooks and kitchen islands and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And then I sort of managed to, you know, collect enough tools to, to make that our initial collection of lighting. And I mean, in hindsight, it's surprising that because that first year or two was, you know, kind of to the bone, you know, you're kind of pretty close to every Mm -hmm. month in month out. But I, my wife and I at the time, my girlfriend, who was now my wife was, we were both sort of in that similar situation where we kind of had each, we're following a path that wasn't like a big financial path or like this is how you make money or anything. Right. It was just it was much more sort of a creative exploration. Hey, we've got to take a quick break, but we'll be back with more David Week in a moment. Support for Clever comes from FreshBooks. We believe that good design betters people's lives, and so do the folks at FreshBooks. FreshBooks helps small business owners and freelance creatives save time and get paid faster with their beautifully designed, simple cloud accounting software. It's ridiculously easy, so you can quickly get back to creating or designing. Create an invoice in 30 seconds or log expenses on the go with their newly designed mobile app. To test drive FreshBooks intuitive design free for 30 days, go to freshbooks.com clever and enter clever podcast or clever in the how did you hear about us section. And so you were repped for a long time with your products and then you ended up opening your own showroom. What was the reason for making that transition to having your own space? I guess initially I was at Troy, which was like a great showroom to be part of. It was a store and there was a limited amount of floor space for it. And there's Ralph Pucci, who was sort of the ideal showroom Mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, Chris Larica, another mentor of mine, was selling his stuff there. And he introduced me to Ralph, and I was played it pretty cool. You know, I wasn't, like, trying to really hard to get in there, but I figured, like, it would happen if it happened. 
after talking to him off, on and off for a year or two, he agreed to take the collection. And then, and that was a really great opportunity. He was the kind of classic, you know, Leo Castelli kind of gallery for furniture, where he'd give you a little stipend to make the work for the collection or for the shows. And then you would get a show every year, every year or two years. And um, he would promote it properly. And he had this beautiful showroom. And he had a big list of followers. So it had these big buzz openings. So it was, it was great. And it was a great way for me to transition from talented, small-time lighting designer to, you know, someone of scale that I actually did ask Garner some legitimate money and kind of grow a, a business properly instead of just being, you know, hand to mouth mm-hmm. and like it was in the early days. Does that coincide with getting more employees and, and growing the whole business? Yeah, I mean, that was, and again, that was all learned on the job. I mean, wholesale retail, like, and it was kind of crazy. I mean, the, the reason it worked is because I could make all the stuff myself. Mm-hmm. There was no, it wasn't like I was buying a hundred of anything from anybody. I was just buying steel from people and then forming it. And I think with the determination and the sort of perseverance aspect of, you know, and if I got an order for eight lamps, I'd be like, oh my God, now I got to make eight of these things. <laughs> and so then I, but you know, you just turn to and make it happen. Mm-hmm. So you were doing a lot of spinning or turning? I had a guy in, up in Greenpoint who did all the spinning. Okay. And he was, a, he was my initial vendor who I still, I love him today, to this day, this great Colombian guy. He's almost retired now, but, but he was really fantastic about, you know, he was the only guy I spent money on. So, yeah, and I was with Ralph for almost 10 years, which was a great run. I really appreciate everything I learned from him. But then at some point, it sort of, it sort of felt like that I was on a track. And it was, and the salesmen were good at selling specific things. And there was, and what was expected of me was very clear. It was, you know, make another one of those things or make another one of those standing lamps. So it wasn't the opportunity. It wasn't the sort of like open-ended aspect of the making process, which I had more to say, and I, and I wanted to sort of try out a different way of saying it. What is that different way of saying it? The great thing about art and the act of making is you know, there's a presentation, and there's mm-hmm. the, the, the reaction you get from people. And the work was great, and I'm very proud of it, and I thought and people loved it. You know, everyone, and they've always, I've had such great support over the years of people appreciating the work. And, you know, when they buy something, they'll be like, I always wanted one of these, and I'm so happy I finally have one, which is such a great feeling. But... At the same time, well, you know, there's more to be said in creating a sort of surroundings for the piece that you show. It was always very much the Pucci veneer mm-hmm. that was sort of on everything there, which was, it was great for what it was, but I wanted to see what kind of veneer I could have on my own, like how to present stuff differently and how to just to sort of find a voice for yourself and then find a way to connect with people directly and sort of have a, a relationship with your buyers instead of a relationship with a showroom. Sure. It's sort of like making these babies and then sending them off to somebody else to sort of take care of and show and talk about. And you, you sort of by disconnect, get the feedback on the pieces. But when you have your own space, you can get really creative with how you influence that space. I was always really interested in installation art because I really loved creating and controlling all aspects of a certain environment. I mean, that's the maximum expression of, of voice. Yeah. So I can see oh, totally. how having that space for you, and I've been in the space, it's magical. <laughs> it's magical. Well, but having that space for you just gives you a lot of latitude to really express yourself. But also, yeah, like you said, meet and form deeper relationships with the people who are involving themselves with your work. And very much when you create something and you're connected to it like that, it goes out into the world and it's an extension of the relationship you have with that person. So I could see why you would want to have some face time with those people as well. So I've read that you employ a technique called formal reduction. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, it's a good health plan. You know, you have to run three, eight miles a day. And, no, I'm just <laughs> I knew we'd get some of that dry humor yeah. in here. No, no. <laughs> I like the, the formal reduction. That's one of those like catchphrases that, or like not catchphrase, but it's like it was, it's just got in the catalogs and it sort of has persisted 
Oh. And it is. <laughs> well, but it we, is did, true. we did do a little it, research. <laughs> and I guess in the end, there's kind of two ways of making, whether you start from nothing and build or you start with everything and take away. Mm -hmm. So I, I think just for me, the removal of material is much more natural and, you know, feels much more comfortable to me than kind of adding on more and more things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, form reduction is just, it's, and I do like that word a lot. I was into the two, the phrase, just in the sense that it can be as like literal or, you know, symbolic as you want to make it. There's very little more satisfying than taking a piece of wood on a belt sander and sort of shaping it just to see what's going to happen. I don't know. There's, yeah, there's so many great things like that where, you know, just giving subtlety and subtlety, I feel like often comes from the act of taking away. It's hard to sort of add subtlety to a, mm, to a right. design. Yeah. So let's talk about toys. All right. I am looking at a cube bot right now, which you are very well known for. The cube bot is a little robot toy that uh, is made of a wood. That, yeah. Yes. Right. That can be shaped into, it can, has like a movable joints and you can kind of put him in any position. Um, and you've spun off a couple of different iterations. I, I think now you've got a gorilla, right? And some other, yeah. other products. And, and you even have like a giant cube bot, right? I do. <laughs> you made one. Yeah. So, so everybody loves the cube bot and, and all of your toys. And I guess I'm wondering, like, where did that love of toys or love of, uh, or, or like a boyish sense of wonder and curiosity, did that come from playing with a lot of toys like this or just woodworking or where does all that come from? I think, I, I don't know if it's, if it's official, but I feel like one, I have always heard that, you know, the things you design best are the things you need or the things you have in your own life. So when I had my first child, it was my son and he got action figures and we started just like collecting random, you know, masters of the universe or, you know, whatever, like weird rubber action hero heroes that are in the bins at the uh, Salvation Armies or yard sales. Um, I remember very clearly, like the guy, he got a little tiny Spider-Man action figure they were playing with it. It was so well articulated. Like the joints were just unbelievable. And it was like a $3 toy from China. So I was like, how on earth? Like who's designing this and who's engineering these like mm -hmm. little, you know, ball joints at this, you know, it keeps the whole anatomical truth of this, of the figure. But mm -hmm. so that, I mean, the, actually the gorilla came first, like uh cube in the end was a distilled version of all the animals that I I did before it. So the um, gorilla, the Hanno, which again, just sort of came actually out of, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this term formal reduction, but. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, I just but, learned about it. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, we just took a belt sander and, you know, clamped it to the table and then we got chunks of wood and we made it the full scale model, you know, right there just from scratch and just kind of making the forearms. And I mean, I remember uh, very clearly sanding the backside of the forearm where it's got this great flat plane that was a nice curve down to the fist. So, yeah, so that was the initial thing. They were very sculptural. And also, I remember I had G.I. Joes when I was young, and they would always fall apart because they were like the 70s versions before they were all plastic. They'd have like elastic bands on the inside. Mm -hmm. My mother would curse me every time because, you know, they'd break, and then she'd be like with knitting needles trying to like scoop the elastic bands out of the inside of this guy's plastic chest. So Hanno was kind of built the same way like a G.I. Joe was. It was, you know, we drilled holes through the middles of all the, all the body parts, and they came up with this little locking system where you just put a slot through the side. I mean, if you're looking at a Cubot now, it's the same exact thing. So initially we made the gorilla, the bear, the elephant, Hattie. Yeah, so those were the three... And those took so much time and effort. We, we would sort of lock ourselves in a room, a white room, and for three weeks we just like kind of carve shapes until we found the final version of it. And then Cubot was just the real like distillation of that, where it's like let's just make like the squares thing we can come up with, and so yeah. just a really sort of very clean version of a very complicated idea. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were making these, did you have any idea that they would be such a sensation? It, I remember that day we finished the first one. I was like, that's good. That's a really, 
I mean, I would imagine it's the kind of thing when, you know, the police wrote Roxanne or something where it's like, you know, <laughs> it's a hit. It's a hit. This is definitely a hit. I'm, I'm not really going to worry about that. This one's going to find its way to somebody. So, yeah, it sort of felt right from the, from the very beginning. Yeah. So Cubebot brings joy to humans of all ages. That's a that's a really fun one and a nice one to have in your arsenal, I bet, to counterbalance all the beautiful lighting and furniture. Yeah, I often joke that Hannah the gorilla was a cry for help. <laughs> it was, but it was that thing where it's like, I mean, I did lighting and it's always good. Then I did furniture and people were like, yeah, where's your lighting? And then, you know, yeah. But then finally by doing the gorilla it was, it was enough of a departure where it changed people's perception of the company and the studio and, you know, me specifically. So I think before that, I remember going to like a, a meeting with an architect and they're like, oh, I thought you were like an older French man or something. <laughs> and it was like based on my work. Yeah, it was, so it was nice to have like those animals as a different calling card than, than the lighting. You had a studio for years in Dumbo and you've, you've just moved your manufacturing facility to Bed-Stuy. Do or die. <laughs> no. And uh, I know you have the showroom in Tribeca and I'm, I'm wondering like is, is most of your manufacturing done in Bed-Stuy and is it mostly done by machines or skilled craftspeople or how's that set um, up? We, I want to know what the business looks like. Yeah, well, it's sort of, it's just a very expanded version of that very original thing where the frames we make and the components we have made. So we work with machine shops for CNC um, machine pieces. Mm -hmm. So any, any lamp has like a handful of custom made parts and then also a few elements that we make ourselves, but they're all fabricated in house. And I've been in the Dumbo studio for 20 years. So I think all the habits that were there were just completely ensconced. So the opportunity to kind of like reassess the whole process that we undertake to make things and then build a building around that idea has been so much fun. I mean, we have just barely scratched the surface. We've only been in there for a few months, so we haven't really had time to even play yet. Oh, that's so exciting. I mean, normally when you're starting out, you just find what you can afford and then you kind of adapt to work within yeah. the space. You make the space work for you. Exactly. Being able to sort of really get granular with your whole process and figure out what, how to streamline it and how would it make life better for everybody and then build a space to support that. That's really effing exciting. It is. And it's truly, it's, and it's so much fun. I mean, the business has grown. I think leaving Pucci was a big challenge and opening up the Tribeca store was a very <laughs> big undertaking, but the whole structure of the business changed completely at that point. Where, you know, now we were responsible for sales and deliverables and shipping and promotional aspect of it. So, I mean, that whole taking on that aspect, all those aspects of the business were really, you know, it's a very big undertaking. And yeah. then, but then to do that same thing with manufacturing right afterwards, it's, but it's great. You know, we've, we've grown the business completely naturally. There was never a rule book as to how we were supposed to do this. And there was no sort of specific, like, I'm sure if I had written this down on paper 15 years ago, I would have never done it. <laughs> we actually hear that from a lot of people. Yeah. And I think things have, have changed a little bit. And it's so hard to get off the ground without, you know, proof of concept and some sort of metric that this is going to succeed. Yeah. So you have an art background and, and you did a lot of design work, but... I mean, you've been able to grow a business and be an entrepreneur. Is that something that's natural to you? Or did you just hire somebody who had that strength? I, yeah, I think there's a level of natural innate, I don't know, instincts for it. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, I'm mean, certainly not a great business person. I mean, like the work itself has supported the business much more than my incredibly clever, you know, marketing <laughs> skills. But Although I have seen some videos that you've created that were incredibly clever. Oh, those are, yeah, those are the funnest. I mean, that's yeah. again, back to the, you know, that's kind of like talking about leaving Poochie or kind of finding your own voice or even the Eames videos. It's like, you know, it's kind of this great, great opportunity to, yeah, to present yourself in a way. And those videos are so much fun to make. Like that one, especially of the Canal Street one was such a highlight. 
in the yeah, whole process. We'll be sure to include a link to that um, mm-hmm. in the show notes. They're really fun. Yeah. And that again, that was funny because I was just like walking down Canal Street and finding three guys and sort of having a sense of them. And yeah, and they got the joke and totally went for it. And it was just like, it worked out so well. <laughs> it's super New York. I love that about it. Let's dive into your personal life a little bit um, and expose you to the world. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, I understand that, you, that your wife uh, is also a creative. She's an uber creative. Oh, that must be exciting and inspiring to have a, a dynamic like that. C- can you talk a little bit about what an uber creative she is and what your dynamic is like when you collaborate? She and two partners, friends. Uh, we were all friends in school. They started the company two by four which is, you know, an amazing, amazing business now. Just, I mean, they just, again, stay true to their ethics and they kind of created this amazing business that now is so well-respected and they're having the opportunities to, you know, work with clients that people would kill to work with, but they have such a great personal relationship with those people. I think they're, you know, 50 people working for her now and wow. doing projects with Prada and, you know, major retailers and That's awesome. they do all this great work, all of this museum work. But anyway, she's CEO, so she's pretty. Damn. So I know, man, she's Hot blowing up, girl. Lady. Tell yeah. me about it, man. She's on Seriously. your arm, too. You're a baller. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious about home life, like not power dynamics so much, but do you guys challenge each other? Do you, do you, are you? curious about similar things like do you both pull a thread and just end up like going down a rabbit hole of some sort of new fascination or how does the sort of curiosity and dynamic between you and your wife play out at home total silence (laughs) (laughs) how was your day dear (laughs) i think there's a level of that that like the work is so intense that the last thing you want to do is talk about it when you get home sure sure i think but when we confer on stuff, it's mostly like, you know, mechanics of the business or when did you do that or how did that project go? And it's much more about support than anything else. It's, yeah, it's much more supportive and like just making sure that she's happy and, you know, we're, we have time. We both have time for the kids and everything. How many kids do you have? 16. Wow. And she's CEO. <laughs> You guys should have a show on TLC. <laughs> You're right. God. No, we have two children. Yeah, a 14-year-old boy and an 11-year-old girl. Do you try to foster a lot of creativity from them, or are they not interested in art, design, or anything like that? How or, What's that all about? I'm trying to squelch that as much as possible. What I want no. to know is, are you teaching the 14-year-old boy how to fuck with the acid trippers? No, he's actually not. He has shown very little signs of that he's got he's got the total dry wit. He's totally <laughs> devilishly yeah. smart and funny, and with perfect timing, <laughs> but um, super understated. And she's much more overstated. The similar similar sense of humor, but um, no, they're you know it's the funny thing about growing, raising kids in New York. My my only concern is that you know the same way we talked about when you go to RISD for the first time and your head explodes. There's, these kids' heads are not going to explode. You know, they've seen so much, and New York City is such an amazing place to grow up. There's so much culture in the city that I almost worry that they're going to lose their their sense of wonder or sort of just discovery. You know, I I know where you're coming from, and I kind of think that there's always a point in life when your your head's ready to explode. So if it, if you know they're very cosmopolitan, it's not going to be because they're, you know, exposed to, let's say, city life in a way or creativity like at art school. Maybe it's going to be nature. Maybe it's going to be like climbing a mountain or something and their head yeah. will explode. Um, yeah, that's that's the hope. So we talked a little bit before about your sense of, of business and you said that seems to come fairly naturally. Are there any personal or professional weaknesses that you have? I think I guess it's the the moment that you don't trust your instincts. Like I think I think it's I've proved to myself over and over again that I'll probably make the right decision. 
mm-hmm. but I invariably put myself through the ringer before I get there. Yeah. Just being like, I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, should I have done this? And I think life would, have, would be a lot easier if I could just be like, I'm doing, you know, just like there was never, look, you never look back kind of thing. So that's been one of those things to try to get better about. Well, I think it's nice for you to share that with us because I think so many people go through that, that it's almost like healing to know that it's even somebody like David Weeks kind of has that, <laughs> that sort of yeah. moments of, of self-doubt or putting it, yourself through the ringer before you finally sort of cave into the idea that your instincts are on point. So you mentioned relationships with other people um, and like you like to develop a relationship with your clients. And you also seem like somebody who there's a real warmth about you. Um, I think, yeah. (laughs) And I think you're, you're a very genuine person and maybe it's the, you know, the Southernness in you or just who you are and you're good parents. But what do you think is one of the most important qualities a human can possess? No, it's kind of corny, but I think the sort of act act of not judging, because people always say that like when, or just sort of accepting everybody, especially like in the times that we're living in right now. It sort of feels like, I don't know why people are so determined to hate each other. And in the end, it's like, no, I'm just getting coffee from this person or I just, you know, it's just like, we're all here together. And that's kind of the, should be the fun part of it. And it should be the most sort of satisfying part of the whole process. But, you know, I don't know. It's just, that's so baffling to me when people are determined to hate and sort of resent and, be envious of each other. Mm. I, I agree with you. And I think your curious nature is also kind of what informs your non-judgmental nature is because if you're curious about somebody and you find out about them, you're always going to find out something you, you didn't expect or you didn't know before. And if you judge from the outset, then you're not going to ask those questions or, or find out that interesting information that gives you such a bigger, more deeper, clearer picture of that person. And so I think yeah. curiosity and non-judgmentalness kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, and, and to be open to things. I remember just, there was like a wedding that George and I were invited to, and we got, we sat at the table where our, our cards were placed. And it was like a very weird mix of people that didn't seem like the kind of people that you'd be fed with. You know, I guess it's, you know, more peers, and these were like aunts and uncles and you know, neighbors or the, the bride. Mm-hmm. And I had this moment where we were like, oh, I don't know what we're going to talk about. But then the woman next to me was like, I'm a puppeteer. Which I was, <laughs> at the moment I was like, puppeteer, all right, now we got something to talk about, you know. Yeah, like, that's awesome. <laughs> which is like, it was, it was just that funny moment. It's like, you know, you could be like, great, I'm not at the cool table. But instead it's like, no, no, this is awesome. I would love to talk about puppetry or, you know, whatever <laughs> insurance policy yeah. this guy is selling or whatever it's just you know it's just kind of yeah just to be open to life and just sort of have have it happen for you know just yeah just to be open to it yeah make the most of of a bad situation even yeah yeah or just to you know whatever you never know where you're gonna learn anything yeah well your curiosity probably leads you down a lot of different paths is that something that you use when you are having a moment like that, a design moment that might be equivalent to like a writer's block. Do you use that curiosity or is there anything else you do to kind of refuel your creativity? I think a writer's block, I've never had a problem with because in the sense it sort of always felt like you just have to make something. It's like mm-hmm. all you have to do is cut some wood and you're kind of back on track again or bend a piece of metal or something. But as far as refueling, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's my age, but I kind of like being, you know, three quarters full instead of, you know, topped off at the, mm-hmm. the top. I think the trick in life is to find that moment. Maybe not when you're not in top gear, but you're like in third or something and sort of mm-hmm. moving along at a good, a good chop. Do you schedule time for your design work? I, Cause I'm sure that you do a lot of other things in, in your company, but you know, you're still a designer and an artist. So do you schedule in creative time or do you just tinker when you feel like it? How does that work for you? No, I think we've sort of set up the company now where like it's managed by great people. So I've actually managed to sort of try to remove myself as much as possible from 
the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, you're always needed to make those decisions, but I think my intention at this point is to try to try to design as much as possible and try to like let the sort of you know fluid time of creativity just happen and being able to access it or being able to act on it when it happens because it's sort of like the curiosity thing it's like you know you can have coffee at a coffee shop and have an idea based on the edge of the register or something right and if there's a way to document that and at least like put it put it aside whether you get to it now or maybe never but you know just to kind of make sure that you're clued in all the time and can also always uh, you know sort of access those ideas are you the kind of guy that has like a sketchbook in his bag or something, or would you take a mental picture and go back to the workshop and start carving a piece of wood or how, what, how does that happen? I admit it. I've got a sketch bag in my bag. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, yeah, I could do that forever. It's like that weird, like whenever I take an airplane flight, it's like, you know, you just kind of fill the pages as you go. I don't know. I think, it, yeah, it's just the same, like the same thing we've been talking about, about like observation being observant and thinking right. about stuff, and being aware of how people use things. So in terms of the future of the studio or in, in the future of David Weeks personally, is there any sort of product or dilemma or design challenge that you have yet to reckon with that you just know at some point you're just going to be driven to tackle it? Yeah, I was just thinking about that question yesterday. We just recently got a new car and I just, I don't like it. I think it's really annoying in the sense that it's got like, <laughs> all this technology and it's like really soft and gushy and there's no sort of real like connection you have with it. Mm -hmm. And then I think, and then also watching my kids play on iPads and stuff. But I think if there's anything I would want to try to keep exploring is the sort of tactile quality that design can give to, to life. And sort of, instead of these like glossy flat glass panes that we touch and, and they, you know, sort of virtually experience everything, like yeah. the sort of the actual act of, you know, like leather or wood or metal or, you know, a cement floor or something, just to kind of make sure that that when I design, they're sort of still based. The designs are still still addressing real world stuff. I think there's kind of a, a craving for that. I think that's one of the reasons something like CubeBot is so successful is because of that tactile quality and those joints are very analog in a way. Yeah. I got a, a hybrid like 10 years ago and I still can't get past the push button start. I, no, I miss totally. the turn of a key in the ignition. I miss feeling the engine sort of kick in and accelerate under the, the pressure of my foot. Yeah. And like this is the first car we had without a stick shift. And even though they have like, Oh no, it's got paddles or whatever. It's got like, you know, all these like gimmicks that make you think that you have gears or you can, you know, control your own life. But the, <laughs> in reality, it's like it's all set up for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want like a 1975 something, you know, Mazda or, you know, a Nissan something from 1983 or something <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like some car that's just like, it's still got raw edges and it's, you know, sort of the gears aren't right. And, yeah. Yeah. And you can still kind of hear the road underneath your feet and stuff. And you can hear what's going on with the car based on how the, the engine sounds. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And I think in the way, yeah, the analog relationship you mentioned is, I mean, that's really disappearing. And I think it's, it's a really special thing about being a human and being on this planet. Well, you're a special thing on this planet, David. <laughs> oh, God, guys. You know. No, it's great. Thank you. Before we let you go, is there a project that you'd really want our listeners to know about? Something that's coming up or something that came out recently? Yeah, we just did a whole new lighting collection here called the Auto. It's been a success. It's been really satisfying. It took a while to make, so it's really great to have it out and all hanging here. So the full installation at the store in Tribeca that has that. And then the project we're working on for next year is this. We're working with some crafts people in Dakar and Africa to do a woven line of, of furniture. Oh. Cool. And that's, Ooh, yeah, keep us so posted on that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. No, and then we've it's been two trips this year, and we're going to go back again probably in a couple of months. But the whole talk about analog and talk about world, like real world, it's so so tactile there, and it's like so much fun. It's such a great you know um, anecdote to the modern Western world. 
that we live in every day. And it's about people too. It's got all the sort of nice things that I always, but whatever this whole interview has been about. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a big thing. Those are the two of the latest things we're working on. Yeah. And our listeners can also, can they come to your showroom or is it by appointment? No, no. That's why we're here. See, <laughs> got that one-on-one relationship, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. No, yeah, please come down. 38 Walker. Yeah, we're open Monday through Friday. And yeah, it's fantastic to have people come through and sort of look and see and get their reactions. Your URL for your website is, is it davidweekstudio.com? Oh yeah, just davidweekstudio.com. Great. Instagram is just davidweekstudio. Facebook, davidweekstudio. And Twitter is davidweekstudio with a capital T. <laughs> no one S. Oh yeah, one S. That's one S, right. Yeah, it's David Weeks Studio. The S from studio and the S from studio. Weeks are the same. Yeah. yeah it's very exciting all the great stuff you're doing so thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us yeah it's been a delight yeah you too isn't he just a charmer he's really funny (laughs) well charmer is actually the wrong word because that sounds like he's you know just sort of blustery and charismatic and and smooth talker I guess what I meant is, isn't he a really sort of lovely, sincere, warm person? Yes. And I think he's he's kind of an anomaly, in, in my opinion, because he's very artistic and very creative, but also seems to be comfortable being an entrepreneur living in New York City with a Southern upbringing and yet a very laid back attitude about things, which just doesn't seem to really fit the description of like a really successful New York designer to me, but somehow he makes it work and it's pretty refreshing to hear him. Refreshing is exactly the word I was going to use because he is absolutely devoid of whatever it is that compels people to talk about themselves in a self-aggrandizing way right. or in a salesman way. Like he just doesn't have it in him. And so I certainly didn't get even a whiff of insincerity at, at any point with him. No, not at all. And I think he feels very comfortable in his own skin and confident in what he's doing. And I love that he got that big architect house project and he was just like, yeah, I could do this. And like, you know, if this goes wrong, I'll just make it right. (laughs) I know. I was wondering about that. And I remember when I was first starting out too, I got a few big projects like that. And I, I think it was also like youthful naivete (laughs) that, that compelled me to like, feel like I could handle it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that. I don't think youthful naivete is what he had. I think he had this like, undercurrent of confidence yeah because he there's still a, like seems a difference like that. there yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it's not like he learned to get scared of things as he got older he was like yeah i'm just gonna roll with this and if if it doesn't work out then like he said with his dad like if you cut it wrong you just cut another piece of wood like what's the big deal i you know, know? <laughs> and i totally was like relating to his dad i was like but but no i really want to cut it right, right the right. first you... time and i want to think about this and i don't want to buy another piece of wood i want to <laughs> i was like oh god I'm the dad. Right. Me too. And it's interesting because, you know, uh, a lot of us like freak out over that stuff and it stresses us out, but like, it's really not the end of the world. Like, yeah, you can just go get another piece of wood and you can cut it again. And it's not that big of a deal. And I think that sometimes we overstress ourselves over things that really aren't that important. So exactly. And I learn from him. Absolutely. One of the most powerful things he said was talking about how the project should, you know, it, 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 when it liberates you, it's very exciting. And I think one of the things that I can be guilty of is belaboring a project so that the fun drains right out of it because I just overanalyze or I plan or I prepare too meticulously. And liberating is the opposite of how I feel at the end of the project. Right. There's like a sense of relief and thank God that's over. But yeah, and maybe I'm really proud of it. But like, was the process that fun? No, it was strenuous and right. arduous. But the only person that's putting that strain on your, you is yourself. I know, I'm doing it to myself. You know, sometimes when you feel like there's an angel in your heart playing a harp and she just plucks like the perfect note. That's what happened when David Weeks said that. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes liberated. That's how I should feel when I work on these projects. I got to get get there. Yeah, me too. 
That was an important thing I think he said too, is when you make these really beautiful objects and then somebody else sells them through a showroom, the outside world forms this opinion of who you are. And so it was nice for him, I think, that he gets to create these videos and these toys to kind of ride sidecar with his lighting and furniture to be a more full spectrum picture of the of the real David Weeks. Yeah, and you can connect better when you know more about how the designer is as a person. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here, too. So, yeah, I hope we did it, Jamie. I hope we did it with this one. Me, too. Thanks for listening, guys. Please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And go to cleverpodcast.com to see more of David's work, read the show notes, and sign up for our newsletter. You can also connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We love to hear from you, and we appreciate all of your comments. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modell of Your Studio with music by L1011. 